What the future will bring, no man can say. But one fact is certain. Mankind stands at the crucial crossroads of history, the threshold of a new era, the atomic age. For the people of the U.S., skilled in the uses of science and technology, the atomic age is profoundly significant. Across a continent, enormous in its agricultural potential, Americans have drawn from the earth a rich bounty, have built great cities, have reared towers into the sky, have spun intricate networks of highways across the land. By the application of science, industry has grown increasingly productive, making possible a good way of life. With assurance, Americans look with an abiding faith to the future. For many, citizen and scientist alike, atomic energy means the promise of a more abundant life. But for many another, the atom is a threat, an evil promise, the paralyzing panic of our time. Thus, to answer the perplexing question of the atom and its implications, the people have turned their attention to the Forum of Public Affairs have sought to search out realities, to find the facts, or to listen to men of science, like Dr. Jeremiah Morley, famed geologist, the embattled founder of the now defunct Society to Save Civilization. It was Morley who told a Los Angeles audience that a series of atomic explosions, either accidental or deliberate, could set off a chain reaction to annihilate every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. It could cause the death of every living thing. In a gloomy report, Morley took a dim view of history, recalled the tragically repetitious story, the decline and fall of all past civilizations. Said Morley, modern civilization could, by the phenomenon of atomic fission, be brought to dust and ashes. For example, if an A-bomb were detonated at the Empire State Building, the area of total destruction would cover an area of two miles. Now, since the A-bomb is already obsolete, consider the area of total destruction of an H-bomb. And science has promised us bombs a thousand times more powerful, poisoning with radioactivity all the air and water of this earth. This could mean not only the end of our own civilization, but the very possibility of any future civilization. What are we going to do about it? I'll tell you what I am going to do about it. I have a plan, a plan to preserve human life on this planet. I hope you will join with me in carrying it out. The response to Dr. Morley's appeal was immediate and enthusiastic. The Society to Save Civilization was set up. To its headquarters flocked amateur do-gooders and professional scientists. From them, Morley chose a staff of experts. Dr. Max A. Bauer, eminent geophysicist, ousted by Hitler from the University of Munich in 1933. Dr. James Paxton, metallurgical engineer, twice winner of the McKenna Scientific Award. Joan Lindsay, medical doctor and ardent feminist, who, for her research in biochemistry, was named winner of the annual award by the American Confederation of Women Scientists. Dr. George Coleman, authority on soil conservation. And Andrew Ostengard, sand hog, explosives expert, marine veteran of World War II. It was this team, qualified each in his own way, that helped set in motion Morley's audacious project a daringly planned program, which he took three months later to the board of directors of the Carlyle Foundation. And so my colleagues and I believe that humanity can escape annihilation, can find a temporary haven, a promise of hope that come what may, life can be sustained deep within the earth itself. Far below the surface, we shall seek a natural, a geological shelter. We have a team ready for the effort. All we lack are funds. Can we get them from your foundation? Dr. Morley, I believe it would expedite matters if I were to ask the questions. We're a uh, layman, you know. First of all, isn't the inside of the Earth solid? The interior of the Earth is made up of vast caverns and air pockets joined by natural avenues uh, leading from the surface. Natural avenues? Funnels and fissures. Such a fissure 
lies within the world's largest extinct volcano at Mount Nelly. That is where we intend to start our journey. Well, uh, these funnels, how far down do they go? Hundreds of miles, perhaps thousands, to the very core of the Earth. But isn't the inside of the Earth, the very core, a molten, fiery mass? To the contrary. The latest body of theory holds that the inside of a sphere, such as the Earth, is cooler than the temperature at its surface. And how would you traverse these thousands of miles? Uh, Dr. Coleman, the perspective drawing, please. This is a cyclotron. A what? It's an amphibious conveyance based on the principles of an ovoidal atmosphere. A what? Like a submarine, with the mobility of a tractor. Its head contains a burrowing device, and its walls can withstand extremes of temperature and pressure. But even with the cyclotram or the uh, bathosphere or the whatnot, how do you know you'll be successful in finding this underground haven? We don't know, but we must try. There is no other alternative, no other cause, no other hope of keeping the spark of life alive. And uh, the cost? That's a lot of money, Dr. Morley. Well, surely you don't expect that. But we do. I know you and your committee mean well. Mean well? Next you'll be calling a starry-eyed idealist. Dr. Lindsay, you're out of order. The whole world is out of order. And I suppose you and your associates consented right? We couldn't have said it wrong if we tried. The appropriation was denied. To carry on his work, Dr. Morley issued repeated appeals to the members of the organization. It failed. And so, last week, the Society to Save Civilization was itself extinct. And what of its leaders? Of Professor Jeremiah Morley and his enthusiastic colleagues. Where were they headed after a year of devotion to a lost but spectacular cause? To newsreel reporters, Dr. Morley had only this to say. We have no plans. We have no hope. Better stand by, Frank. We may want to run that again. Well, gentlemen, what do you think? It's like asking a man what he thinks of his own obituary. I thought you'd like to see it before its release, in case you had any objections. Now he thinks of our objections. You've been crucifying us for a year, Mr. Thompson, in the newspapers you edit, the magazines you publish, and the syndicates you control. And now this newsreel. Just a minute, gentlemen. You seem to have me confused with my father. He dictates the policies of our publications. Like father, like son. Nothing, Dr. Bauer, could be more unscientific. As a matter of fact, my father and I never see eye to eye on anything. So he's the villain of the piece and you are the hero. Quite the contrary. My father has all the virtues of our society. He makes the money, I spend it. The large occupation. Oh, I have no occupation. I'm strict. You wouldn't. That idea of yours, Dr. Morley, about exploring the inside of the earth. You know, I'd like to try that just for the kicks. I'm sure you wouldn't find it very exciting. Oh, I don't know. Gentlemen, I came here tonight with a proposition. I have some money of my own. I would like to finance your project. Are you serious? Sit down, my boy. There's one stipulation, however. I go with you. And what could you do? I'm afraid you don't realize what you'd be up against. Going a thousand miles inside the Earth just to satisfy a whim? Gentlemen, you act as if the fate of humanity hung upon you granting me this whim. the expedition are being completed ahead of schedule. And Morley is pleased with our progress. The cyclotram nears completion. Adequate nutrition in concentrated form has been perfected. And for an auxiliary water supply, a Sloan H2O condenser will be used. By the study of our laboratory animals in a new environment, we expect to gather important scientific data. At last, the cyclotram is ready to be loaded aboard the SS Aurora.
Our destination, the extinct volcano, Mount Nele, where the inside of the earth begins. This was our base, a lonely, desolate beach at the foot of the extinct volcano. Well, let's go. to spend our last night on Earth. You sound like we'll all be dead in the morning. It's a possibility. We stay here. Andy, take the controls. Follow the ridge line. Keep out of the ravines. Ascend at an angle of not more than 33 degrees. RPM and follow our chart plan R4. Check. What's our elevation now? Approaching 6,300 feet. Angle of ascent 19 degrees. Speed constant 2100 RPM. I wonder how long this iron lung is going to hold up. You can still dig out. Ah, you can't get rid of me so easily. Give me a reading on the forward rotational unit. We're up to 9,000, climbing at 24 MPH. Angle 31 degrees. At that rate, we'll make the summit in four hours. <laughs> Dr. Moore. We are meeting some unstable isotopes. Increase the lateral unit to 12,000. Hey, this is getting rough. We're approaching position R4. Our computation show an error of less than plus 0 0.14. Good. We'll reach the summit in 30 minutes. We'll make a final check of our position before we enter the crater.
Professor picked this volcano for our expedition. Maybe this one could come to life, too. No, not a chance. No bet on it. No reason for us to wait till dawn. We'll proceed into the crater now. Just one last look at the earth. Yeah. What a way to remember. Follow the downward spiral. Keep to the inside ledges. Speed, 1,200 RPM. we descend ever deeper into the volcano, I have observed no unusual physical symptoms. Paxton seems withdrawn, irritable, but with such an annoyance as, like Thompson present, the condition may not be considered abnormal. The descending ledges are getting awfully narrow. We must be at position R18. Uh, yes, we are. Cut the switches. We'll be doing some hiking now. Better have some breakfast. Rise and shine. Morning. How can you tell? Breakfast is served. Breakfast? Well, I've always said there's nothing like starting off a hard day's work than with a good breakfast. Hey, Doc? How would you know? You don't like my kind of guy, do you? Not very much. But I'll make an exception of you. You I don't like a lot. Coleman, take the controls. We'll scout the way on foot for you. Follow on down along the widest lake. Did you expect him here? A garden of Eden? I'm not talking about volcanoes. I mean Wright Thompson. He doesn't belong here. None of us belongs here. We're doing what has to be done. He doesn't feel that responsibility. He's just a useless piece of excess baggage, a, a selfish thrill seeker. But without him, there'd be no expedition. Pardon me. Kind of deep down there, isn't it? Bunch of those scientists. Well, what's your trouble? Oh, nothing, but don't they ever talk? Not unless they got something to say. That's the way it is with smart people. Maybe they're not so smart. Maybe they don't know what they're doing down here. Listen, Buster, each one of them has taught us more colleges than you've flunked out. So what are you doing down here among all those brains? 
I managed to make myself useful. It might be well if you did the same thing. Doing what? This. You lead the way for a while. Depth below means sea level, 2.6 miles. The Yangstrand Underground Geological Expedition reached this point June 12, 1938, and was unable to proceed further. Why anyone who follows us should want to go further, we do not know but we assume that they have good reason for doing so. Good luck. Bangstrand were living today. He'd know the reason. The world has changed since 1938. The world has changed since yesterday. You better get to work. the other volcano. We'll have to work this side. Paxton! Yes, Dr. Morley? Start making density readings on that wall over there. Yes, sir. This is it. The point of least resistance. Okay, Andy. I'm ready. We'll all go back to the cycle tram. Fuses one and two set. running into. There's only one way to find out. and clear. You can take your masks off. Pressure seems normal. I wonder where it leads. That's exactly what we're going to find out. Lead the way, Andy.
How did it all happen? Long time ago, the earth above was covered with water. And when the sea vanished, it left great limestone deposits behind. Was all this limestone? Yes. And then the water gathered in underground streams and carved out the soft limestone. Drop by drop, year by year, the water dissolved the stone. Each drop carried a tiny particle of sediment. That's what formed these columns. About an inch every thousand years. Well, how long did this whole process take? About 200 million years. Hello, Coleman. Coleman, uh, bring up the tram. We'll proceed from here. We're down a hundred miles. You better pull up. Cut the switches. It's funny. When we first got here, I felt a sort of exaltation. Now I feel depressed. I don't know why. The oxygen content is adequate. I know. But I too feel suffocated. Maybe it's the unreality of this place. You know, once when I was working in the Holland Tunnel, I got cut off from my crew for 10 hours. I felt this way then. I think I know what it is. It's loneliness. It's a feeling of a person away from people. I felt it on the top of a mountain in Tibet, in the jungle, and on the Arabian desert. It's like the last cord tying you with humanity has been cut. It's more than that. People have dignity only in relation to many other people. Alone, a man is as useless as any rock out there. No, you're both talking nonsense. Nature doesn't influence man. Man influences nature. One man, one strong man, can change nature. Ah, oh, you're on, Dr. Paxton. It isn't one man, it's many men working together. Right, teacher? Men together are no more than sheep. One man standing alone leads the way. Then the sheep follow. Please, gentlemen, well, I'm please. embarrassed for all of you who call yourself scientists. Swayed by a self-indulgent young fool. I'm going ahead. I hope that by the time you catch up with me, the atmosphere will have cleared the cobwebs from your brains. I'd better go with him. It isn't safe for a man to be alone down here. Ah, he's all right. He's the leader type. I'll go with him anyway. There wouldn't be leaders if there weren't sheep like me to be led. I still don't see any sign of Paxton and Coleman. Well, keep going. Gas! Gas! Paxton and Coleman! They forgot their gas mask! a grave a hundred and ten miles under the earth.
on. It's too late to turn back now. for a good hamburger. <laughs> and another thousand for onions on. Dr. Morley, our water supply is... Cut the switches. Looted by the gas fumes. Yeah, somebody left it open. Back there just before Paxton and Coleman took off. I guess I forgot to close it. Oh, you can't It was an accident. An accident? We may never find water again. Now I suppose you'd give a thousand dollars for a glass of that. Andy, there's a job to be done. We've got to find water fast. And in this area. Yeah, I know. we got about a chance in a thousand of finding it. Thing like this enough to drive a man stir crazy. It's no use. 240 miles inside the earth. Yeah, and no water. Here. I've been setting it for the animals.
Go ahead. Enjoy yourself. It doesn't cost a cent. Stop it! Andy! This is ridiculous. We have something larger at stake than your personal petty feuding. Now, you two can come with us or stay here and kill each other. I'm going after the cyclotron. Never mind. I'll go get it. Running water. But where where is it coming from? It's, it's behind the wall. It is running water. Well, why don't we go through the wall with a cyclotron? No. There's this brother. There's still such a thing as too much water. It could be an underground sea. Andy, Andy, now bring a couple of heavy hammers. What's up, Professor? We think there's water behind that wall. Try breaking it in. Sure. Here, let's take care of that arm. The outside temperature is rising fast, up 280 degrees now. It was if it could go on forever. The temperature is dropping fast. The outside pressure is dropping too. Good. Condensation will soon take place. There. You're a pretty good doctor at that. You're a pretty good patient at that. Thanks. Here, put this on. It's water. Look. Look at it, there's water!
Come on. Are you all right? What shall we do now? All right, I'll say it. I'll say what's on all of our minds. Don't try to read our minds, Thompson. Just speak for yourself. Then I say, let's go back. And I say, go on. But look at Joan. We've gotten nowhere. Deeper and deeper into nowhere. We've failed. Would our failure be any less if we turned back now? Our chances of living would be greater. But if we go on, we're dead. Dead is Paxton and Coleman. That's a chance we have to take. The stakes are high, higher than our lives. They involve the life and death of all mankind. That's a great speech, but I won't buy it. All right, let's put it to a vote. Thompson? Go back. Andy? Go on. Bauer? Go on. Seems to be a deadlock. I suppose none of us would like to reconsider. Doesn't woman suffrage count here? What do you say, Joan? I say go on, and let's not waste any more time about it. How are those burns coming along? Good as new. How are you, Doc? Oh, I'll get by. Here. What's it for? Does it have to be for something? Does everything have to be functional? It's a good luck ring. Save my life in Tibet. Here, take it. <laughs> Why give it to me? Haven't you ever been romanced before? Not 900 miles below sea level. Then it's about time. If there were any flowers around here, I'd pick them for you. There's a highly scientific theory which states that if any man and any woman are cast away anywhere for any length of time, sooner or later they think they were in love. That's what's happened to you. If that theory has any value, it should apply to you. Does it? No. Well, I guess I need a little more time. We'll talk about it later. How about pulling this jalopy level for a minute? Just long enough for us to get out of these straight jackets and stretch. How much longer is it going to be like this? Oh, right. What difference does it make? Funny. If it's going to be like this the rest of the way, why go on? Why waste time? That shouldn't make any difference to you. You've never done anything but waste time. Listen, you meathead. Just because you're a sand hog that likes to go grubbing around in the ground, and you're a mountain goat with his head in the clouds. Stop it, both of you. 
I say enough of this. What happened? I don't know. It's not water. We are out of it. This might be what we're looking for. Let's make a landing and explore the area. It's got a high calcium content, but it's drinkable. Hey! Look what I found! They're cave pearls. Cave pearls? How much they work? Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate? Well, how about this? Sulfate of lime. Plaster of Paris. Professor, you take the romance out of everything. Here you are, Doc. Two souvenirs from Haiti. Vacation land of the underworld. Thank you. Back home, I'll be the envy of every kid on the block. I'm not so sure, Joe. Take a cave pearl into the sunlight, turns gray and ugly. And the flower? It'll crumble to dust. Hey, Professor. How about these fish? It's a rare species. They're edible, though. Ah, they have no eyes. I think I'll stick to pills. They lost their eyes 10 million years ago. What kind of a place is this? Flowers that crumble the dust in your hands. Stones that look like pearls. Fish without eyes. Nature, sure, a practical joker. I suppose you could have done better. Ten million years, I couldn't have done worse. Morley believes this is the shelter we've been searching for. A valley of shadows where light can be sustained. A shelter for humanity. And yet our morale is very low. What do we want? A ray or two of sunshine? A change of seasons? Starry nights? In this graveyard, Morley thinks... We can build a new life right here. You mean this is what we're looking for? You'll get used to it. Well, who wants to get used to it? Why don't we go on a little further? But we've come 1,100 miles already. How can you measure what we've been through in miles? I say let's go back or go on. But this is no place. What is your wish? We've come so far. Let's go on. Where do we go? I suppose we'll have to explore both channels. I'll take the right one. Right? You take the other. Why me? I'll tell you why. I'm sick of taking your orders. That's the trouble with you, Thompson. That's all you do is take. You never give. Without me, there wouldn't have been any expedition. Well, that's not enough. It's time you gave something yourself and not your pocketbook. Andy. We might as well get started.
and the You're supposed to be taking it easy. Try to get some rest. Listen to me, Wright. You've been like this for days. How long can you keep it up? He didn't like me any more than I liked him. Yet he saved my life. It doesn't help brooding over it. But he died saving my life. He did what he believed was right. My trouble was, I never believed in anything. You can start now. Morley wants to go back to that valley of the shadows he liked so much. Well, it, it's better than this. But it isn't good enough. What do you want to do? I too want to go back. But all the way back. Now that Andy's dead. Now that Andy's dead, we've got to go on. We've got to until we find what we're after. If we fail, then we can talk about going back. Over there. a continuation of the other river. No, I think it's just a seepage from it. Listen. What's that? Look. It's like daylight. a vast and radiant cavern deep within the earth. Along the shores of this incredible cave by the great underground sea, gathering up the waters of the earth. A strange sunless light is reflected from the phosphorescent dome. The glowing peaks are weathered and sharp, and the gull is deep. The wind is soft and the climate pleasant. Vapors rise up into the bright dome forming luminous clouds. The area is rich in chemical resources. That means power and industry, according to Bauer. And Wright says, a real estate boom is on. Oh, we got a match? Sure, sure. Hmm. How you coming, Professor? Uh-huh. Still? 
feeding those rabbits? They eat like pigs. Small wonder they're expecting in a couple of weeks. All of the rabbits? No, silly, just the lady rabbits. Tell me more. Here, make yourself useful. Get some more water. <laughs> Explorations and surveys of the surrounding area continue. Morley and Thompson have set out toward the southeast to investigate the land and its potentialities. This is a strange kind of sand. That's not sand, that's volcanic ash. The ash will make good fertilizer for our crops. Crops? <laughs> Let's face facts, Morley. This is a desert. The very word means deserted by life. And you talk about crops. It can be irrigated. This country has everything. Water, soil, air, heat. Yeah, you're forgetting one thing, though. No sunlight. Science can adjust that. Crops can thrive without sunlight. Perhaps. But can we? species is it? It's a fossil remains of a species of lungfish. He breathed by means of both lungs and gills. When he came out of the sea 400 million years ago, he was the ruler of the animal kingdom. With his lungs, he was a pioneer in a new way of life. How did they become extinct? Like some of us on Earth, they seem to hurry the process of extinction. Let's get out of here. <laughs> What's the matter? You act like you swallowed a canary for breakfast. This is the day, right? This is what day? The day we're expecting the first litter of rabbits. Well, who's going to pass the cigars around? You apparently don't realize the importance of it. Oh, I'm sorry. By observing the rabbits, we've already learned that they respond to nature basically as we do, as any mammal does. And from their young, born today, we can predict how our own young will respond in the new world. Dr. Morley, follow. Come on. You go ahead. I'll get plenty of hot water. Well, how many boy rabbits and how many girl rabbits, huh? What's the matter? They're dead. They're all born dead. I can't understand it. Why? Why? There must be some cause, some biological reason. We've been searching for causes. Our investigations have been checked, tests rechecked. Examination of genetic tissue proves that all experimental animals born here are sterile. You know what this means? This new world. A haven for the dead. This is the end of the line. Now we know that the human race cannot reproduce itself in this underworld region. It appears our mission is a failure. Then we can't stay here. At least one generation could. And after that, what? The end of humanity. That I won't accept. Neither can you run away from facts. Always run away. Climbing mountains. Trying to prove something. I don't know what. I too ran away. Instead of fighting. But now, I've run away again. And I was always afraid I couldn't compete in a man's world. I think I want to go back and try again. Go back to what? To a world bent on self-destruction? 
We can live the rest of our lives here in peace. Morley, you're wrong. This isn't peace. This is a resting place for the living dead. I don't believe it's the end of the world. I don't believe it's the end of mankind. You're young. You don't know. I've lived through the terrors of two great wars. I've had enough. blind alley. Ever since we started, we've been in a blind alley. We can't bury ourselves in the earth and expect to live. Maybe that's a secret. Morley understood. Strange. We didn't know it before. I used to be afraid of death. I was afraid of life.
above the level of the underground sea. We found a channel to the upper ocean. I'll live forever. 